Welcome back. It's a statement of the obvious that budget issues confront all of us, whether government or industry in almost all sectors. Mission assurance in a budget constrained environment, we'll examine this in a panel led by Dr. Wanda Austin, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Aerospace Corporation. Dr. Austin, we look forward to your panel of distinguished thought leaders. Thank you very much. Captain Chandler, thank you very much for the introduction. Good morning, everybody. It's, it's late enough that I can get away with that, according to Lon Levin. You should have had enough coffee now that we can expect a response. It's my pleasure to welcome you this morning to the Mission Assurance in a Budget-Constrained Environment panel. Uh, I know this is going to be a lively discussion from a diverse and very distinguished group of experts. We're here today to examine and get fresh perspectives on the challenges we're facing in terms of mission assurance in the extremely budget constrained environment that we find ourselves in. There are a few things we're absolutely certain we will have to keep in mind in both the short and the long term. First, it is agreed no matter where you pose the question, whether it's Washington, industry, with the military, the civil arena, that space systems are essential to our way of life. We really can't do without them, even sometimes when we don't realize that we're using them. Second, that the cost constraints we're facing are here to stay, and we can't afford mission failure. Third, the customer requests for greater and more exquisite space capability will only increase. And fourth, we have experienced an unprecedented string of successes in the EELV program, and we certainly want that to continue. But we know we also need to find approaches that balance capability and affordability. And the new entrant launch providers are working to provide additional options to help strike that balance. I'm sure that there are none of you here in the audience, but there, there are some out there who are skeptical and will say that mission assurance practices and affordability are mutually exclusive, that you can't have one and get the other as well. In fact, the goal needs to be to have mission assurance and affordability practices that result in well-formulated, match to the mission systems. So the question becomes, how do we do it? How do we deliver successful and affordable capabilities on orbit? Let's ask our distinguished panelists here to answer that question for us. Each member of the panel will provide a short opening comment reflecting their perspectives on mission assurance and how it is affected in our budget-constrained <coughs> environment. Um, you should be seeing some numbers that tell you where you can tweet your questions to or text your questions to this morning, and we will incorporate those as we go along. So feel free, if you've already been dying to ask a question of one of our panelists, to send your question out. Our first panelist is Brigadier General Roger Teague, Director of Strategic Plans, Programs, and Analysis at Headquarters Air Force Space Command, U.S. Air Force. I'm really happy to have the general here. He's really happy to be here because otherwise he'd be in a dentist chair. But we're really thrilled to have him because of his extensive space experience. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working with Roger when he was the program director of the Sibris program, which has been very successful, and, and when he was vice commander at the Space and Missile Systems Center at Los Angeles as well. General Teague, thanks for joining us today, and we're ready for your opening statement. Thank you, Dr. Austin. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Dr. Austin, it's great to be here this morning. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to participate uh, with this distinguished panel. Uh, it's certainly an honor to participate uh, along with the uh, other delegates as part of the 29th National Space Symposium. Um, I think yesterday, General Shelton made it abundantly clear, if you didn't hear his opening remarks, uh, that we will continue to assure that mission assurance corners are not cut. Mission assurance is the very heart of all that we do in space, uh, and it's, you know, it touches every aspect of our space enterprise. And while launch remains the most challenging mission of our programs, we want to continue to drive solid mission assurance attributes across each of our program segments, to include the ground segment, with specific focus on assured operations. 
Now on the launch side, it's well noted and we should rightly stand up and be proud of, very proud of the fact that we're working currently on a string of 57 straight uh, national security space launches. We'll <laughs> knock with you. <laughs> uh, that's unprecedented in uh, space flight history. I think uh, 90 uh, straight EELV launches. Uh, but as my distinguished panelists know to my right, that uh, you're only as good as your last launch. And in this cost-constrained environment, mission assurance is becoming increasingly challenging. Now certainly our nation's recent focus has been on our challenging fiscal environment and as the Air Force Space Command programmer, I can assure you that we do face some very difficult decisions and priorities uh, straight ahead of us. And there are some who would say that we could make cuts to mission assurance in order to save money. And while we're certainly interested in making launch more affordable, this doesn't relieve us from the mission assurance requirements. We have to continue to meet them while looking for innovative ways to continue to cut costs. Many studies have shown that the cost of mission assurance is typically only two to 5% of the spacecraft and launch stack cost. That's pretty cheap insurance, especially when you consider the potential loss of a payload and a launch vehicle had we not done and paid so much close attention to mission assurance. And we've looked many, many times over the recent years at our mission assurance processes, and I think our current approach really hits the sweet spot. The nexus that General Shelton described yesterday that effectively ties people, our processes, and our products together, resulting in highly successful programs. But in the end, I believe that mission assurance really is, mu is as much about attitude, culture, and leadership more than anything. Fortunately, we've enjoyed great success and benefited from hard work, dedication, and firm commitment from our teams of trained professionals supporting all of our launch missions, each with their own unique challenges and risks. And I believe that same spirit, disciplined process, process adherence, and measured approach to risk will allow our partnership to continue to be successful in the future. And while the budgetary pressures we face are real, a strong, balanced mission assurance construct and committed partnership will continue to guide our success in the future. Again, Dr. Austin, thank you for this opportunity and I look forward to your questions. General Teague, let me just ask one follow-up question. Uh, as we sat through the executive forum yesterday and some of the other uh, discussions that have been going on this week, one question comes up that you know, the industry responds to what the government asks for. Is there anything that the customer community can do or behave differently that would help us get a different result? I would, um, I, I think that the government is, is working towards that end. I think that we are leaning forward in a, in a number of different responses and a number of different efforts. Um, and I can cite a couple, but I, at the same time, ma'am, I, I think that um, you know, collectively, I would ask industry that question is, is and, my, and my colleagues on this panel, is do they believe are there opportunities for the, the government uh, likewise to continue to make change and, and provide a more positive environment? Um, I, I think there's been a lot, a great deal of work that has already been performed in identifying innovative business opportunities uh, in order to take advantage of some of the efficiencies that are inherent in commercial practices. Uh, I know at, out at SMC, the MILSATCOM program office, uh, has, their advanced concepts division uh, has conducted a study, the Resilient Basis for Satellite Communications uh, Joint Study, Joint Operations Study, or RBS. Uh, I think that's an excellent uh, example of where we've been able to field and take in a number of uh, commercial ideas and best practices and apply them uh, for future uh, payloads. As well, I think that uh, uh, we need to do it better and certainly recognize the opportunity to take a, a better advantage of commercial uh, acquisition processes and best practices uh, when, they, when they best fit the, the government model. Um, the government will continue to be a demanding customer. Absolutely. Uh, and, and it's important from a national security space aspect um, that we recognize the unique nature of the missions that we launch and the, and the, the unique nature of our business. Um, and and I, I think that there are opportunities, though, as we look forward, especially in the hosted payload office, 
um, SMC, uh, the development, uh, Director of Developmental Planning, uh, is looking to explore some of these unique opportunities as well. So um, I think that we're trying to lean forward uh, and that we're making good progress there, but we're certainly not resting on our laurels. We know that we've got miles to go before we sleep. Super. Thank you very much, sir. Our next op sta opening statement will come from Mr. Michael Gass, who is the President and CEO of the United Launch Alliance. Mike is responsible for the Atlas V, Delta IV, and Delta II launch missions, and last month successfully launched the second Sibir's Geo payload on an Atlas V. It's a busy manifest in front of us as well, Mike, so I appreciate the knock on the table, and we really appreciate you taking the time to be here with us uh, to share your thoughts. Well, thank you, Dr. Austin, and it's a pleasure to be here with the other panelists. Uh, I've got to congratulate the Space Foundation for this new table arrangement with the split. Uh, it's uh, have Gwen, Gwen and I separated. It saves us from a Jerry Springer moment here. Uh, uh, but uh, no, seriously, you know, it, when it comes to the National Space Symposium, we all come together as a as a community that's committed to the greater good for mankind and, and space. And uh, as we all are sometimes competitors, teammates, it's great to come together here and, and share ideas. Let me start with uh, EELV is, most, is arguably the most successful national space program, for sure, in the last few decades. How many uh, national programs could say they were delivered on schedule, on budget, met and exceeded all of the requirements that were set out, which included, you know, obviously, uh, all the performance characteristics, as well as a, uh, a reliability improvement and a cost reduction. Remember, the EELV system was driven from our heritages of multiple systems, all having unique niches that narrowed the opportunity for satellite systems, created redundant infrastructures that led for cost and efficiency. C incredibly successful program that started with a good acquisition approach, good requirements tied to the national need of, of what were the core requirements. Good systems engineering, good system design, and an acquisition strategy that enabled it. And that, those lessons should not be lost in the recipe for mission assurance and mission success. I always have trouble when we talk about mission assurance and what is it and what is the definition. At ULA, we always talk about mission success as an end product. But as we have this debate about mission assurance, the nation always has a lexicon problem of what is mission assurance. The classic definition is clearly the oversight, the IVNV, and they look at the heathens in the Air Force or aerospace of all that extra cost that they're putting onto the system. That's not what it is. Uh, it is an underlying recipe that's really required that includes IVNV, that includes oversight, looking at problems differently. But in a broader definition, is everything we do to support national security requirements or our unique customer needs to assure their missions are, are met. That includes things like we have a national policy of having assured access. We had, when the EELV program was founded here in, the, in Colorado Springs in the mid-90s, the goal was one EELV system. But as a national need, we said we want to have two. That comes with a cost penalty to give a short access to have that flexibility to have two systems to do what one system can do was a national need so that our the end mission can be assured of uh, be, meeting, getting into space to meet our national security requirements. Is that mission assurance? When we talk about mission assurance in a budget-constrained environment, uh, we really have to remember what our mission's all about. It's really about those end effects and recognizing where is launch in that equation. Our job is to fight gravity, to give enough energy to put a body of incredible capability into space, to put it in orbit with enough energy to sustain there for many, many years. The, the cost of those missions, the criticality of those missions, the cost of launch is a fraction, and oh, by the way, the cost of that classic definition of mission assurance is a small fraction. The penalty, if that mission is not successful, is huge. Uh, at one of these conferences about two years ago, we added up the cost of all the satellites that we launched in, the, in our manifest, and you put the non-recurring, recurring cost, and it quickly came to $25 billion. And I agree with General Teague's comment, about 2% of, of, of you could drive, potentially drive for mission assurance, and I think, it, frankly, that's high number, but let's assume you can buy it. Could you come up with an insurance, a better insurance policy 
than, than that 2%. When you, we launch a commercial market uh, satellite, we typically pay in the 6 to 10% range for insurance. So if you just look at it from a business case, it's a great uh, investment. Last comment will be, when we talk about budget-constrained uh, environment, the United States is good at uh, kind of uh, repeating history. The last time we were in a budget-constrained environment, we did sync things in the acquisition strategy that affected mission insurance that has a broader effect on the industrial base that has an impact on risk. And we, we uh, ended up with the results of failures that put our national security at great risk. Let's not repeat those, those same mistakes. Thank you. Just one follow-up question for you, Mike. You know, we, we all take great pride in the launch success that we've experienced. Um, can you share with us any big lessons learned uh, that have enabled us to reduce the cost of launch? I mean, I know we're conclusive with your team that we're always looking for opportunities. One was we, you know, tried going without a dress rehearsal, wet dress rehearsal for certain configurations. Is there anything that you would share from your perspective as being a big lesson learned? Well, there's, I think there's two lessons learned, I tr and one of clearly is of, of alignment of priority, and, and that comes with clear requirements and a clear acquisition strategy that aligns the whole team, uh, the contractor and the government team, to stay focused on, if you will, the commander's intent. And we know when we get uh, disconnected, and I'll give it an example, uh, award fee contract. Uh, it, it is a spiral of cost growth. Yes, you can really get focused on some priorities of do everything possible for mission assurance, but is that the commander's decision or everybody in the government's decision of what's enough? And so you have the contract. Having the right kind of contract and center fees with the right balance is a great alignment tool to help drive down costs but stay focused on the priorities, and I would submit the current acquisition strategy of ELV has that balance. Clearly, our incentive as a company is heavily focused on mission success, but we got incentive fee contracting structures and fixed price that drives the, the drive to efficiency. And then we know the processes of efficiency for cost reduction are the exact same things we need for mission success and mission reliability, and that's drive out every bit of waste from unreliable processes that can potentially cause a failure. So it's synergistic, it's aligned, but you can get an acquisition strategy that gets out of alignment quick. Good point. Great. Our next panelist is Rob Strain from Ball Aerospace and Technologies Corporation. Rob has just recently been named president at Ball Aerospace and Technologies Corporation. I know we wish him well with his new role and responsibilities. I think it's been about 10 days and you haven't screwed it up yet, right? <laughs> so far, so good. Uh, Rob has been in the job a short time, but he certainly is not a novice. He previously served at, as the COO at Ball. Before that, he was the center director for the Guided Space Flight Center. So Rob, would you share your thoughts with us, please? Uh, good morning, uh, and thank you, Dr. Austin and my colleagues here. Um, mission assurance in a budget-constrained environment, that's our topic today. Um, has any, I think any of you have spent any time around here today or in the industry for a while, uh, we clearly are living in a very different cost environment. You may have even heard the word um, affordability a couple times over the last few weeks. I think this is an environment that we're going to be in for a long, long time. And I think it's, it's going to require all of us to change how we think about our businesses and how we do uh, mission assurance. As a somewhat of a thought piece um, for conversation, I'd like to offer uh, an idea on how we might all improve uh, affordability of our missions as it relates to mission assurance. And that is to, to, to encourage the broader government to adopt a mission level approach to mission, uh, mission assurance requirements. Um, we've had some success with that uh, at Ball Aerospace. We work with the intelligence community, uh, DOD, commercial, international, we, we have handfuls of these customers that are very open to what, again, what I call mission level, mission assurance, where, um, where there is assurance on the mission. People understand what it is we're trying to accomplish and make sure all of those things um, are in place, um, utilizing uh, the proven industry uh, practices. 
uh, many of our organizations represented here today have been in uh, business over 50 years with all of our government um, agencies and have had a surprising level of success, albeit we all do it just a little bit different. Um, and I think um, having the government uh, recognize those differences uh, it would be of enormous benefit. Where we get into trouble sometimes is when, when uh, different uh, government agencies or organizations ask us to do it a certain way, which is different than another way they, they might have asked or a different way than we do. I think that's where we have escapes. Um, I guess what I would further say is, is that what we're asking for is, a, is quite a good conversation um, early on in the program, a matching of expectation and what the watch should look like, not how to build the watch. And um, many of us, I think in this room from time to time, um, get engaged um, on contracts where they're very specific of exactly how to do it, which gets outside of our individual company's um, pro proven practices. Um, I think a little bit more attention to this mission level um, approach uh, would reduce the amount of oversight, certainly in some cases reduce the amount of formality um, that I think at the end of the day does not always contribute to mission success. It would uh, reduce a waste associated with complying with varying, varying sets of requirements from a very diverse customer community that we all uh, service. Um, and it also would enhance affordability um, and, and even um, within a mission, different components of a mission being done at slightly different levels. As an example might be um, EDU, um, how one would do an EDU versus a flight system. Does it have to have the same command media? I would argue not, uh, not always. Um, so um, in summary, I think that is the thought piece I'd have people think about. Uh, the other following up on the general's thought is, or a suggestion to the government is, I think there ought to be uh, work done by the government amongst themselves, sometimes with us participating, sometimes maybe not, uh, where you look across uh, the different agencies and how they're applying their mission assurance standards um, and see where best practice, practices uh, can be made there, um, making it a little easier for industry uh, to interact in a slightly more common way. Okay, appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> Just to follow up a little bit with you, Rob, so it sounds like you're saying that you'd, you'd like all of your customers to speak with one voice with respect to mission assurance, that that would have an, Im <laughs> impact, have an impact on affordability. I think it would have an... I think it's unrealistic that they would ever speak with one voice. <laughs> um, but I don't think it would be unrealistic that to, to um, have and expect um, that they could look at across their or organizations of best practices in their own naked self-interest. Mm -hmm. I think we in industry would benefit from that. The differences would become a slightly more minor, um, I think, um, as we go forward in this whole uh, chase of affordability, while not sacrificing mission uh, success, we really ought to look at what are those best practices against the, uh, the whole uh, plethora of, of space customers. And I, I think if you look even within certain um, agencies, different programs with very similar uh, goals, mission goals are being done today very differently. And I think for those of us that serve that whole community, it's very difficult. We, that's where we have our own escapes. Okay, super. Sitting next to Rob is Ms. Gwen Shotwell, who is the president and COO of Space Exploration Technologies, or we all refer to it as SpaceX. Gwen is, I'm sure, still celebrating the completion of the second successful Dragon Cargan resupply mission to the International Space Station just last month. SpaceX has set an objective to transform the way rockets are made. Gwen, would you share your thoughts with us, please? Thanks very much, Dr. Austin. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, the world has changed pretty dramatically since, uh, since I last spoke here a year ago. Um, 
the Air Force and the NRO have uh, opened up the EELV marketplace to new entrants, which is an extraordinary, uh, an extraordinary feat. Uh, in addition, uh, we've completed three successful missions uh, of launching Dragon into orbit and getting Dragon successfully integrated uh, and berthed with the International Space Station, two under a cargo resupply and operational contract, and one under a Space Act, under a development agreement. So I think we've been able to demonstrate the ability to develop as well as certify and operate highly complex systems as well as integrating them into an existing government architecture, a very highly complex government architecture that happens to have astronauts on board here, namely the ISS. This was done in an incredibly cost-constrained uh, manner. In fact, the development of both Falcon 9 and Dragon, the ones that eventually uh, put uh, birth with the International Space Station, was under a billion dollars. We spent $850 million actually developing Falcon 9 and uh, bringing Dragon to the place where she could birth with ISS. But five Falcon 9 missions and three successful Dragon missions uh, to ISS it's a great start, uh, but certainly there's no uh, room for complacency in this industry. And I think what's critically important here is that we've developed systems uh, that have a mission assurance process that go alongside of it, um, but clearly done in a, in a new and, and different and, and cost-effective way. So I was asked to provide some thoughts as to you know what, what have we done or, or at a high level um, how do we see mission assurance? Uh, just to provoke some good questions from the audience, actually, I'm, and I'm going to be very brief. Um, there's no question that a strong mission assurance process has to be rooted in, in, in a very robust and reliable vehicle design. If you have a tweaky design, you're going to spend a lot of money doing a lot of things to ensure success of that particular vehicle or system. I also think mission assurance, uh, as General Shelton yesterday said, uh, mission assurance is kind of the the bringing together the people, the process, and the product. I think mission, a strong mission assurance process re absolutely requires a work environment of clear accountability and responsibility, as well as collaboration. I think that's critically important uh, when you're working across multiple uh, subcontractors, multiple customers uh, with insight and oversight responsibilities there. Strong mission assurance requires either 100% process control or incredibly perceptive test and verification program. And I think neither of those are fully achievable 100%. Uh, so I think what's necessary is to tailor mission assurance processes to fit the individual organizations. We all act differently, we all develop things differently, uh, but yet we can all be successful. So I think it's important to wear that framework or keep that framework in mind that mission assurance should be tailorable to the organization. And finally, I think a robust mission assurance process is, must be rooted in lessons learned and, and flight data must inform and evolve the mission assurance process. At any, at any rate, thank you very much for listening and I look forward to your questions. Great. You talked about you know, what are some of the things that we need in a good approach to mission assurance. Would you also comment on the impact of the contract type and how that influences affordability? <clears throat> There's no question. We've not been shy, not that we're really ever shy, um, but we're not shy on uh, our drive to have uh, uh, fi fixed price contracts. Uh, I think fixed price contracts even if you have to expand the scope of a fixed price contract, there has to be a lot of conversation around that particular change. And I think that will help drive good decision making on what really needs to get done, what really has to happen in order to achieve the requirements uh, that need to be achieved and still do it in a cost effective manner. Uh, if you have an, an open ended contract where you can add scope uh, and can you continue to add additional activity, that conversation doesn't have to occur in the same way. So I think it's critically important. I think uh, firm fixed price contracts drive a critical conversation and keep things affordable. So it gets everything on the table early so you know exactly what the expectations are. Again, getting to the point of alignment that we had here. Yep. Yes. Terrific. Thank you. Our final panelist for today is uh, James Wade of the Raytheon Corporation. And as Vice President of Corporate Mission Assurance, Dr. Wade is responsible for leading 
end-to-end -end mission assurance and performance excellence across the Raytheon enterprise. Dr. Wade has significant ex experience in this area because prior to joining Raytheon, he led the MIT Lincoln Lab Safety and Mission Assurance Office and was the manager for International Space Station Safety and Mission Assurance and Program Risk Office at NASA. Jim? Okay. Well, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank you, Wanda, uh, Dr. Austin, uh, for the opportunity to be on, on this panel. Uh, with uh, distinguished, such distinguished colleagues in the space community. I'd also like to thank the Space Foundation for putting on yet another great symposium. Um, it's truly an honor to be here and to share my thoughts on mission assurance and, and, and the perspectives in a budget-constrained environment. Um, you gave a little bit of my background, which was NASA mission assurance about 20 years, four or five years at, at Lincoln in the same area, and, and then now at Raytheon. So mission assurance is kind of what I do, what I've done. Um, the the uh, company perspective, our view on mission assurance, uh, essentially is customer success is our mission. Uh, we view mission assurance uh, not as a cost that can be cut back and constrained, but as an investment. And, and by viewing mission assurance as an investment, it allows us to deliver the, our customer requested solutions in an efficient and effective manner um, which, which has the reliability and the performance demanded at an affordable price. Uh, so from a historical perspective, if you look at mis mission assurance from a historical perspective perhaps, uh, it, it seems to be often associated with the, the launch and the on-orbit space segments. Uh, we, we view mission assurance as essentially inherent in everything we do throughout our workforce, uh, and, and it doesn't matter if it's on the ground or in space. In fact, we've got uh, a program, uh, several programs. JPSS is one of those. We have an on-orbit segment, which, which is the Vera sensor. We also have the ground segment, uh, which, which we produce for that program. Uh, we also have a facility. So it goes beyond just the systems that, be, that lead into the end, end item system, be it software, hardware, on space, or on the ground, even in our facilities. We have facilities where, that we've designed and built from the ground up with mission assurance in mind. Now, there's a balance to that. We need to match and balance the amount of mission assurance with the customer's risk tolerance. So it doesn't mean that we build a facility like we build a spacecraft, but we keep in mind what the customer's risk posture, uh, risk tolerance is, and that kind of requires some basic tenets of, of how we operate and, and, and uh, how we can succeed on space, on the ground, in the air. And that first is, I would say a, a very close uh, collabor uh, collaboration, communication, uh, clarifying with the customer uh, what the need is, what the customer's needs are, what the risk tolerance is, and it allows us to work with the customer to build a system that's resilient. So it, it's one thing to have a system that performs, you need that performance, but looking at how the system maybe doesn't perform, what can prohibit the system from performing? Looking at how the system can fail and making sure we put in resiliency into that system so we never have those type of occasions. Uh, a second tenant would be the architecture. So rather than trying to inspect in quality or inspect in mission assurance at the tail end, uh, the earlier we get involved uh, to the point of defining uh, the architecture, um, and I believe uh, Rob, you had mentioned about the mission, this, looking at it from a system perspective, that the sooner you can get involved looking at the, the, uh, the system architecture, the overall mission, the overall risk tolerance uh, of that system, the better. And I'd say the third aspect or the third tenant would be in the execution. I mentioned before it's inherent in, in, in what we all do. We don't have a small group that goes and does the, the, the independent inspection. We have some of that, but it's really getting into the culture, into the mindset of how we operate. Uh, we have five basic uh, uh, principles, overarching principles that guide how we execute our programs across the entire enterprise. So, so with that, um, I think we'll have more time for questions. So I'd like to go ahead and thank you again for being able to take part in this panel and look forward to some of the discussions on mission insurance over the next hour or so. Great, thank you. You hit on a, one of the key questions that I wanted to ask today, and, and that is the 
idea that when we talk about mission assurance, we tend to think about the launch vehicle or the satellite. And we know that the mission capability comes from more than that. And you mentioned several things uh, in your opening statement. Um, one word you used that we hadn't used yet this morning is workforce. Um, can you talk about how you drive your approach to mission assurance through your organization and maybe more importantly through your supply chain? Because we know that you know, all of our systems are comprised of second and third tier, fourth tier suppliers who contribute to um, developing these capabilities. Yep. So we have an uh, extremely strong reliance and a very strong supply chain uh, to begin with. Uh, but in terms of, of, of how we drive that culture, how we drive that mindset, we have, we have I mentioned five principles. Uh, the, the principles that we expect from, from, from all of our people, and we flow this into the, the, the expectation on, on our supply chain and partners, is first of all, domain knowledge. We need to know and have the expertise in the domain that we're working in. A second piece is connection. Uh, think of that as the connection, the collaboration with the customer, understanding the customer's needs, understanding how other parts of the system work together. We had two to three different business units working on some of these systems, so that connection in understanding where our pieces fit within the overall mission uh, is important. Um, clearly, we have to have a compliance, so we have to follow our processes. When we build something and we build it, we have to make sure we're building it correctly from a compliance perspective. Uh, I'd say a fourth principle is our commitment. So we expect all of our workforces not to rely on somebody else to make sure they did the job correctly, but they're accountable. They need to have the expertise, the commitment, uh, to be accountable for performing their part of that mission. And the last is performance. We expect our, per, our, our systems to perform first time every time. And so we want our systems to perform. That's our expectation. And, and so those are some of the things we have as our, as our principles on the workforce side. Uh, as a mission insurance organization, we also have a uh, continual improvement process. It's a Raytheon Six Sigma. Uh, it's, it's, I'd say, the, the, uh, the next step above and beyond the standard Six Sigma process in the sense that we tie our, our performance improvements back to business results. So we don't go off and do projects haphazard. We have end goals. We have very focused selective improvements that we allow to improve our processes and improve our programs. And so we have a and, and that's across the company. We don't have a, a small set of, of, uh, of uh, equivalent to green belts, we call them specialists, that go out and look. We have a 93% uh, certification rate across the company. Um, and of course, we have a, a sort of a grace period as employees come in to give them a, a little time to get, to get that certification. Uh, but our expectation is that we have the, the workforce all fluent and knowledgeable on how to perform systemic uh, focused project and process improvements, which feed back into our, our, our command media, our processes. Great, thank you. I'm gonna turn to my colleague here on my left and ask pretty much the same question, because you've gone through a period of consolidation of organizations and moving major facilities. Um, how have you been able to drive your approach for any requirements for mission assurance throughout the organization? Well, thank you. Uh, you know, United Launch Alliance is uh, blessed to have a 60-year heritage uh, in this business, uh, you know, through multiple companies. Uh, you know, the latest two were Lockheed and uh, Boeing as, a, as our member companies, but had heritages with McDonnell Douglas, uh, General Dynamics, Martin Marietta in, in that. And we used that, if you will, that body of experience as we applied it to United Launch Alliance. But just as uh, Mr. Wade talked about, it's embedded with what we call perfect product delivery, which has that element of uh, uh, continuous improvement that's driven by an under, underlying drive towards process reliability. So we had this opportunity to take the benefit of the best of the best uh, from Lockheed and Boeing's uh, heritage uh, in the Atlas and Delta programs and bring it together in, in the United Launch. But it took a structured approach, data-driven, with good systems engineering and risk management tools to drive that out with that focus on perfect product delivery. Perfect delivery is that continuous improvement and drive to process reliability in everything uh, we do, and the perfect product is the result that delivers that mission success for our end customer. That's terrific, appreciate that. Um, I want to encourage the audience, if you have some questions, to go ahead and text them in. I'm assuming that the number has been posted so that you can see it, because I'm not seeing the questions here on the iPad if, uh, if we've had a technology drop here. Um, 
Let me shift gears a little bit and ask Ms. Shotwell, you know, as you work with international customers, uh, how does their approach to mission assurance differ from the U.S. government approach, or, or is there a difference? Well, as I mentioned, mission assurance should be tailorable to an organization. I think each customer has their own perspective on mission assurance, but the foundation, obviously, is 100% mission success. It's the focus for our customers, and clearly it has to be the focus for the services that we're delivering for our customers. Um, we've not run into a customer who hasn't been quite savvy on the things that make vehicles and missions successful. Um, I, th I would have to say we probably learn from, from each of our customers as well, get new mm -hmm. perspectives. Um, and uh, certainly anytime we have, uh, we're, we're shown a new idea, uh, a better way to test something, a new test to run, we will go ahead and do that. Um, regardless of uh, any addition to the contract, we want to do what's smart and what's right, and we want to learn everything we can to make sure that, uh, that our missions are 100% successful. Terrific. I wanted to ask you, Rob, um, we've been talking about disaggregation. We've also been talking about the fact that we'll always need some big satellites that will continue to do critical missions. Your organization has worked on all ends of that spectrum. Can you talk about whether there is an opportunity to be more affordable through disaggregation and through smaller systems, or if in fact there's some other key to success? Um, I, I think there's a lot, been a lot of analysis in our industry on the benefits of disaggregation. We, uh, we're fans. Um, I'm not sure that um, it fits all. Um, I think there, um, I think there will continue uh, to be need um, for the big, big, big systems, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and I think uh, as we're driven down this path of affordability, there will be uh, and now lower uh, opportunities for lower access, lower cost access to space. Um, will brings in the possibilities of uh, doing these uh, smaller mid-size uh, that do maybe 80% of a mission, but maybe at a different risk uh, profile. So um, I think a lot of work's been done. We buy into, certainly we buy into that, uh, uh, to that model. I think to get full benefit though, uh, as, we, as we work down this as an industry uh, path, is, is for the customer community um, as we talked a little bit earlier, uh, to know what we're doing, you know, what industry's doing and what they're doing <clears throat> in terms of mission assurance. Um, again, uh, trying to take benefit of uh, best practices because it's a very different approach than mm -hmm. um, some of the exquisite systems in, in the past. And uh, uh, taking full advantage of, of that, I think, uh, of that knowledge across the government, across the industry is going to be terribly important. Uh, to get the full benefit of that. Super. Jim, did you want to add to that? You looked like you were, had a thought there. Uh, so, so just in general on, on, you know, on, the, on the overall approach toward mission assurance, I, I, kind of, I was going to kind of jump back slightly to a, to a slightly different area, which was how we build mission assurance in, um, which is having the clear understanding of what the of what the customer's expectations are, what the customer's risk tolerance are. And I'd mentioned a facility, ground facility, which is an area you probably don't associate with mission assurance uh, that often. But in Huntsville, we just had a ribbon cutting um, about three, four months ago on a Redstone, uh, the RMS Redstone Missile Integration Facility. And, and it's a brand new facility. It was designed and built from the ground up with mission assurance in mind. Uh, to match the customer's expectation that these systems work. So a year and a half ago, I was walking around that field ruining a pair of shoes and in a suit walking in the red dirt out there. Uh, they had just, um, just prior, had done the groundbreaking, was out there a couple more times, two, three more times over the last year at various stages of construction. And we'd go through looking at what are, you know, how was the system designed? What have we done to make sure that this facility has corrected um, and accommodated for not just controlled, but designed out production and uh, assembly areas where you could have risk. Um, so we have automated guided vehicles that move the missiles around from one station to the next. We've eliminated critical lifts. Uh, we have 
uh, as part of the automated guided vehicles, they'll, they'll move a missile to a, to, a set lo to a test location or an assembly location. They'll position it within one ten thousandth of an inch. We have automatic torque measuring tools uh, as you're applying torques. The system makes sure that you apply them in the right sequence and you have the right torque and it's recorded so you have the full build record all without having to keep paper. It's all electronic. So we have a full build record of all the systems that are built. And, and so that's kind of the mindset, the concept of, of going beyond just um, defining some requirements, but actually following through and saying, here's how we've actually changed our assembly processes. Here's how we built the system to be more robust and end up with a more resilient, robust system. OK. Uh, Terrific. Thank you. Mr. Gass, did you want to add I, a thought? I that? would, because I think it's been a central topic of this conference about disaggregation, and uh, especially when we talk about it for mission assurance. I think that at Gates, we missed the key point that I think General Shelton led off the conference, that disaggregation was about the end mission need, about the risk, toler risk of, our, of our capabilities and really making our capabilities more resilient. I contrast that as we talk about the budget constraint and mission assurance, and I, you know, just to be my New York self, I'll d disagree with what uh, Gwen said, that mission assurance is tailorable to the organization. Mission assurance is tailorable to the mission. And, uh, uh, and if you don't have a risk-tolerant mission, you can't have risk-tolerant mission assurance. Disaggregation gives us an opportunity to change that risk profile. It will actually change the design of launch because it'll probably be a different launch vehicle need. But, and, that's, and the customer makes that decision. And just I'll try to give a short story, but I had the opportunity to support two customers that were starting in the infancy of a, you know, a, a products that we use every day in our home and uh, with television. They approached it differently. One was a risk-taking gambler, and the other one came from a more conservative background. The risk-taking gambler put his first two launches, one on the Chinese long munch, the next one on Proton. Their next launches after each one of his failed. He bet the business on, on that low cost, didn't know how successful the business was. The other company did it in a more classical way. Both businesses turned out incredibly successful. Those next launches, when they had a lot of customers to support, they were both in the classic risk to, uh, mode. They couldn't afford the risk because they had to provide capability. So it was a perfect example. Customers approached risk differently, approached the mission assurance of how they bought their systems and capability differently, but you know, they, they, made, they made their business decisions. Same on a national security. So disaggregation gives us that opportunity to change that opportunity. And it was more, more consistent with, I think, what uh, Rob Strain was saying about a mission level look mm -hmm. at mission assurance, but it's really the end customer that drives it. Super. Speaking of the customer, and not trying to create a Jerry Springer moment, but I have a question here. It's really <laughs> aimed at uh, General Teague, Mr. Gass, and Ms. Shotwell, so get ready. Mm -mm. Am I the referee? <laughs> <laughs> the we question is, do you see critical national assets being launched on the Falcon 9? Sir. Well, absolutely. Uh, we, uh, that's certainly part of our new entrant strategy, uh, the rigorous certification process uh, that all new entrants uh, would have an opportunity to be able to compete for those missions. Uh, and you know, that's core to our, our launch strategy going forward. Uh, and it's, it's fundamental to what we're, we're, we're planning in the future. I, I would ask uh, if I could follow up on one other point, though, because I got a little squeamish um, when we, there was a little bit discussion earlier with regard to the government's ability to speak with one voice. I, I don't know about you all, I can't even get my wife and I to speak with one voice sometimes. <laughs> And it's the ability, you know, I recognize the need um, is certainly important and it's incumbent upon the government um, to, to continue to work towards that end, to work to common specs uh, and standards and, and interfaces and, and continue to drive down risks where we can. Um, I think uh, an initiative started by uh, General Kaler when he was uh, uh, director of the National Security Space Office. Um, we started the National Security Space Industrial Base, of which there was a spec specs and standards working group. Uh, I think forums like that go a long way to help solve, and if you will, create uh, the conversation that allows us to drive down risks in many of these kinds of examples. It's a start, it's not the solution, understand that, but where we can, we need to take advantage of those kinds of situations uh, and be able to address commonality where, wherever we can. Great, thank you. We, we look forward to that. <laughs> Mike, did you want to make, take a stab at that one? Well, 
first, uh, you know, there's no doubt that SpaceX can support uh, national security. They, you know, uh, many of the folks at SpaceX are, are our associates and friends that have been in the business for a long time, and they're more than capable of, of, uh, of supporting uh, the mission. So it's really, you know, again, what does the customer want to do? Do want? Remember, the EELV system was drive to uh, build a system to get you to pool the total national security requirement to get lower cost and higher reliability mm -hmm. by getting, uh, if you will, tempo, velocity, industrial base stability. All those were the you know core tenets of the Mormon report back in the 90s. So we have to question: uh, Can can the industrial base, can the the overall market support multiple uh, capabilities? The barriers to enter into launch business is not uh, that great, and, and the capability is relatively transportable, and especially when the Air Force and NASA uh, uh, provide uh, their technical support and financial support. So can they absolutely? And then we'll, you know, then, then it'll be the question of uh, can we afford, can, what is the right kind of acquisition strategy, and what's that balance? That doesn't it necessarily mean that the two companies have to be on the same set of requirements Great. Yeah, because uh, we, may wa we may want to go back to the niche market kind of approach. So the customer has to sh shape that uh, acquisition strategy. So I think that's a good point about the customer shaping it. And Gwen, I'd ask if you could talk a little bit about the new entrant certification approach that you've been involved in about you know, how you're moving down that path. That'd be great. Well, the, each new entrant uh, is uh, allowed to or selects a path for certification. Um, each organization gets to basically determine how to get certified given a set of buckets that the customer has identified. Um, we've selected an approach where we would have three successful launches uh, coupled with uh, design reviews, uh, audits of our uh, operations, uh, our launch sites, um, and then obviously insight and oversight as well. So I, I do want to go back and, uh, and talk about this concept of tailoring. I think Mike missed my point here. Um, clearly, you can tailor mission assurance to different risk levels for different missions. Uh, but what I'm saying is each organization has strengths, and each organization, whether they admit it or not, has weaknesses. And what you want to do is make sure your mission assurance approach uh, focuses very strongly on the things that they do well, but probably more strongly on the things that, uh, that require additional insight, oversight, um, and uh, additional analysis. Uh, so we certainly look forward to uh, being a launch service provider uh, for these national security missions. There's no question in my mind uh, that we can do this job. We've demonstrated that we can do some pretty extraordinary things. Um, and the concept of uh, is there a market, um, is the market big enough uh, to have uh, providers, and there's no question in my mind that there is, uh, SpaceX won uh, every competed commercial mission in the Falcon 9 class last year. Uh, we have over 50 missions on our manifest, so uh, I don't know how that is an ill-defined or, or a small market. Uh, we're doing very well in the marketplace. Uh, we've demonstrated we've got a very robust and reliable design. Customers respond very favorably to that. Um, the, the price point obviously is, uh, is a benefit to our customers, although no customer is going to buy what they would consider to be an incredibly risky launch at uh, a, a, a lower than standard market price. So I also want to make one more point uh, that uh, Mike says, can the government afford to have multiple for providers? I think the government has realized that they mu that, that's the only way that they can afford. Uh, assured access to space is to ensure competition drives in both product quality, product excellence, and also drives efficiencies. Okay, great. Rob, let me toss one, an easy one your way. So the question from the floor is, I hear some of the industry panelists stating that tailored or agency-specific mission assurance practices that differ from their own commercial practices drive their costs and ability to compete. Is there a way for the government to bring these players in to use their own commercial practices uh, without increasing the government cost and risk? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess that gets to the theme in, in the, this little dialogue between um, my two friends here that I'm stuck between. Um, <laughs> thank you, Rob. Uh, I mean, it gets to the, the government should say what it is they want from a mission perspective. They should, I mean, 
there's no way that ULA and SpaceX and us and others are not going to approach things slightly different. There is an end, though. There, there's a goal. There's the mission, su mission success, not success in design or how one might approach a design, um, you know, versus testing methodology. It's those things have to hold together within within very successful organizations that have done it for a long time. So I think the savings, the 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 help is when the customers, whether they be commercial or DoD or NASA. What is it we're trying to do? Make sure there's alignment and then rely on uh, their customers uh, to use their proven practices. Make sure they're proven and make sure they stick to it. So there's still an audit, there's oversight, there's still the things you need, but don't tell them how to build the watch. I think that's where uh, we all get in trouble and that's where extra cost comes. I think that extra cost sometimes makes people feel better sleeping at night, but does not really add uh, to the mission uh, success. Okay. Jim, here's an easy one for you. Okay. <laughs> the color blue. How has the current and projected cyber threat changed your approach to mission assurance? Well, I can tell you some of the things that we are doing, um, non-program specific, but but universal. So, so one of the things, uh, the cyber threat is is a threat to a mission. And in order to see, achieve mission assurance, I think there's, it, it, it presents itself uh, some new areas where we need to have a workforce and processes that are able to adapt to that. Uh, one of the things that we're doing from an enterprise perspective, uh, which, which I think is fairly unique, is we're laying out a mission assurance certification program that takes uh, mission assurance professionals uh, down some tracks, could be hardware, quality, could be software quality, uh, even mission assurance. And it, it allows folks to have not just training and online training, but uh, experience, and more importantly, all these are leading to skills. So one component of that is, is a software quality, software assurance aspect. So, so that's one way of trying to get a workforce that's, that's able to, and we also have very focused uh, IA um, and uh, uh, information assurance uh, training and certification approaches. Um, so I'd say that's one, one component that we have. And the, um, yeah, that's. Okay, yeah. great. I'm gonna ask Mike to address the same thing and maybe you might say if you're doing anything special with respect to concerns about counterfeit parts. Uh, the questions, yes. Uh, cyberspace and just our overall protection of intellectual property and just that robustness of knowing exactly what's going on through our, our community is a challenge because uh, the same tools and techniques that we use to get seamless for low cost uh, operations to get connectivity through our industrial base is now becoming an issue when it comes to uh, uh, cyberspace and intellectual pr uh, property protection. So we, we first we took down some barriers to open up our access to each other and then everybody's now having to protect their, their boundaries with firewalls and it's making it harder. So we got this, this yin and the yang going on. Uh, when you, you asked a more directed question on the uh, counterfeit parts, you know, that, that data search, that ability to look at the, the pedigree of, of information is something that's critically important to our business and information flow is, is our tool to, uh, to verify it and then you got these counter activities going on to protect ourselves so we got to figure out our way through it. Terrific. Question for Ms. Shotwell. What is the most challenging piece of SpaceX's process to get your vehicle certified for the Air Force? You know, it's probably a question better answered uh, next year uh, when, we, uh, when we hope to have uh, Falcon 9 certified through this, uh, through this process. Um, I can talk about the, the, the biggest challenge we had in certifying Dragon with NASA, so I'll, I'll try to get at it that way, uh, was assuring NASA and providing them the insight that was necessary on our software processes. Uh, we don't follow the same development processes that NASA has. Um, the, ones that, the one that we follow makes more sense for the type of software uh, that we develop and the languages that we develop them in and the environment that we develop them in. Um, so we had, we, we probably spent the most time um, in certifying that software. 
uh, for NASA. Uh, and that included uh, lots, lots of meetings, uh, many audits. As a matter of fact, I think we had three software, complete software audits uh, in the eight weeks leading up to the first flight to the ISS last May. Um, and really when it, what it ended up boiling down to was giving them the insight that they needed to be confident that we knew what we were doing and that we were fully testing, uh, both development testing, uh, uh, element testing, and then regression testing up to full system level testing. So the, the relationships that we developed along the way were critically important. And it's certainly a piece that we look forward to uh, continuing with the Air Force, is developing those relationships, um, getting a sense of trust, getting them familiar with how we do business um, so that they understand when we answer a question one particular way, they understand the context around that. Um, so I anticipate software will be, uh, will be, will be a challenge. Um, it, I'm a mechanical engineer, not an electrical engineer or, so, mm -hmm. or software engineer. So, you know, you can see an engine, you can test an engine, you can mm -hmm. hold an engine, you can watch the fire come out the back end. Software, software's harder. Yes, we've, we've all experienced that <laughs> one time or another in our lives. <laughs> you feel the pain? <laughs> you feel that pain. <laughs> General Teague. Uh, We've talked about you know, commercial space versus military space. Um, can you share an example where you think we've actually been successful in leveraging on the commercial marketplace or the commercial capability? And do you envision that there will be times when the government might encourage us to do more of that? I think off the top. So we, we did chirp. Yeah, Which, certainly, certainly with the, uh, the CHIRP uh, launch, uh, it, it represents, uh, and I think that gets to the point um, that we talked a little bit about earlier with regard to um, mission assurance and being able to have the investment programs uh, and the investment dollars up front, the opportunities to drive down risks earlier in programs. Uh, I think that's fundamental to our strategy as you consider uh, elements like resiliency and the potential to disaggregate some of our architectures. Um, looking at a program like CHIRP, uh, which you know from the OPIR uh, mission area certainly represents uh, new capabilities, new technologies, uh, encouraging wide field of view kinds of uh, sensors that allow us to look at the OPIR mission area a bit differently. Um, but inherent. Uh, uh, and as part of that strategy, I think it reinforces the notion as to why um, the, the budget support and continue to support uh, our space modernization initiative lines. Uh, because I think a lot of those efforts that are done upfront and early in these programs, whether it's CHIRP or any other number of kind of tech demo programs, um, really help ring out a lot of risk. And it brings us all on a common collective understanding of what mission assurance requirements would be needed for a particular program and what the risk equation looks like. Uh, so yes, I, I do believe that uh, as, as a commercial example like CHIRP, um, that that is a good example. Uh, but going forward, I think it's gonna be uh, foundational and critical to our efforts as you look to disaggregate uh, potential other mission areas that we closely examine. We do our homework up front and early uh, to make sure that we understand the risk equation before we proceed on in uh, larger scale efforts. Super, thank you. Let me, let me turn the question around just a little bit and ask you, uh, Rob, if you would m maybe give us an example where you think we were successful in matching the risk profile uh, to the program and the criticality of the mission. Um, uh, a couple, uh, I would point out, where we, we've had enormous success. Uh, we, we build the series of uh, spacecraft for Digital Globe and have done that uh, from the beginning um, with enormous success. Uh, they have a very tight, small team of uh, experts, a very uh, small, independent um, review board that looks at our work. There's very common alignment uh, from the very beginning uh, um, while we, when we start the programs of what it's, what we're trying to do um, and, uh, and they leave us alone. We go build and uh, they get uh, what they want. Uh, a, a typical uh, major milestone, a CDR might have six or eight people uh, from the customer at. 
Uh, we would have, I won't name names, we'll have other customers. Um, we had a review not that terribly long ago. We had actually more reviewers than we had people working on the program. And um, so those were those would be the extremes. Okay. And um, and we see that sometimes within the same um, we see those same extremes sometimes even within the same uh, organization. Sure. And that's kind of the the theme or the point I had made earlier is there's no expectation that the government's all going to get one one page that can't happen. Um, but I think in search for best practices we can get closer. And um, I think uh, some of those examples. Uh, can go far. Okay. Well, we had some examples of speed mentoring earlier this week, so I'm going to challenge you all to give your final comments here in about 60 seconds, and you know we'll see who succeeds here. But just to the top of your head, what's the big message you'd like to leave with our audience today about mission assurance and affordability? Jim, let's start okay, with you. Start. Okay. Good. So, 60 seconds for all of us, or 60 seconds for me? You get 60 seconds. Okay. And you just used 10. <laughs> anyway, and you time's just lost up. 10. <laughs> uh, so, so I would say that, that um, first of all, I'd like to thank, thank you again for the opportunity to take part in this panel. Uh, I would say the, the, the closing thoughts would be approaching mission assurance as an investment, to use that as a focused way to, to find out where you need to uh, focus your attention on design and operational improvements, as opposed to trying to eliminate it as a cost. Uh, I think some of the, uh, the themes that I've heard which, which resonate with what we do is the, the culture, the mindset. Uh, General T. had mentioned this at the beginning. Um, I kind of reiterated, heard it from some other folks as well, which is, is having that mindset, the, the culture, if you will, uh, of all the workforce, as opposed to trying to inspect in uh, mission assurance, inspect in quality. It needs to be ingrained and inherent, um, as, as it is at, at, at our company, and it's inherent in all we do. Uh, a, a third aspect would be the communication collaboration with the customer. Okay. And that is, and that's getting a good understanding of the risks and the risk tolerance, and how the system uh, at, at, at the mission level uh, is, is meeting the customer's requirements. Great. Thank you very much, Gwen. Mission assurance is basically your focus on mission success, and it's critical that the vehicles and the vehicle architecture that you design and build are reliable from the start, robust from the start, uh, and you uh, do everything necessary to ensure mission success. It's everyone's job. It's not a separate mission assurance team that has to come in uh, and, it, and, and, as you say, kind of inspect in mission assurance. Everybody does their job. You've got to, you start with a, really, with a reliable vehicle. Everybody does their job. You test everything you can before you fly, and then hopefully you fly successfully. Great, thank you. Rob? Uh, what they said. Okay, good. I'll take that. <laughs> uh, uh, maybe a little different theme is uh, those of us um, that lead organizations in this what I think is more permanently changing, changed environment from a budget and affordability perspective. Um, as we change and lead, lead our organizations, um, a term we heard earlier today that makes a lot of sense to me is this, the commander's intent. As we evolve, we sort of believe or want to believe our organizations you know, follow these, these new things we're trying to do. They don't always. <laughs> and um, I, we need, as a, as a community, to spend a little more time, I think, um, making sure as we evolve, our whole organizations evolve with us. I go to these panels with some frequency, and people go, oh, we're going to do this and that. But their, their organizations aren't doing that. Right. And um, is to make that final connection throughout the organization, Great. I think, will help. Thank you. Mr. Gass? Well, uh, mission assurance is not something you gamble. Mission assurance is an integral part of our systems engineering process, and it needs to be an integral tool that's focused on the end requirement. Uh, you just can't turn one knob and not, not understand the system effect of uh, gambling with mission assurance. Uh, I always look at the customer's risk tolerance. There was a time when a customer took a, a gamble to go with a new entrant capability, saved about half the launch cost. That was about $40 million in launch price, $700 million of satellites and in the ocean and they're back spending the extra $40 million, but it was $780 million later 
without looking at the overall risk tolerance and understanding of it. Mm -hmm. So you can't gamble, is my message. General Teague. Dr. Austin, thank you again. Thank you and my colleagues for the opportunity to be here today and participate on this panel. Uh, I think from my perspective as we, uh, a key takeaway for Mission Assurance is, uh, again, I think it's about attitude and I think it's about a culture of leadership. Uh, and it's incumbent upon us all that as we are faced with these difficult budget decisions and restricted funding, um, that none of us, that we all collectively work together to balance the risks properly and make sure that we've got the right degree of mission assurance built into our programs, that we not be tempted and take shortcuts uh, when it comes to mission assurance. Uh, certainly, I think our, our reputations, if not our entire enterprise that we're all so very proud of, uh, it depends on it. And getting this right the first time uh, is incumbent upon us certainly now, but also well in the future. Again, thank you. Great. Well, thanks to all of you and thanks to the audience and for the great questions. Uh, I think you've all heard it said before by uh, quoting Ernest B. Rutherford that uh, we're all out of money, so now we have to think. And <laughs> another fact is our business is hard and it is unforgiving. Uh, nonetheless, we know that mission success is required. And through past history, we've learned that end-to-end -end mission assurance certainly works. And so the new fact today is that you know, affordability is the key to the future. So thanks to all of you for your time and attention today. Thanks to our great panelists for your candid comments. And we hope that you continue to enjoy the rest of the symposium. Have a great day.